Our gospel lesson for this morning comes from Mark's gospel, chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did, the man get, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joas, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bag, no, no bread, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet off as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 48, which Helen read just a few moments ago, celebrates Jerusalem or Mount Zion as the city where God's presence is revealed and experienced in the language of the psalm, experienced as a fortress that protects the people of God. It's also described as beautiful. The sight of it, the psalmist says, strikes terror in the hearts of enemy kings and forces. As the psalmist describes it, he notes that it's the place where the people worship God in God's temple for God's unfailing love. And there's something about the way the psalmist describes the city itself, almost as though it's an emblem, a representation of God's unfailing love. It concludes, if you were listening closely, with these instructions. Instructions to tour and to walk about and to admire the city so that you can tell others about the way the city's glory is evidence of God's glory and strength. Walk about Zion, the psalmist says. Go around, count her towers, count well her ramparts, View her citadels, that you may tell of them to the next generation. For this God is our God forever and ever, and he will be our guide even to the end. When Helen and I visited Israel and Jerusalem a number of years ago, one of my favorite experiences took place on an afternoon when we had free time. Helen and myself and our son John Daniel and my brother John had gone back to the old city and we had just gone in through one of the gates when we noticed an advertisement for a self-guided tour. If you bought a little ticket, you could climb up some stairs into the actual wall that went around the whole city of Jerusalem and walk along the wall, walk along the ramparts at your own pace, stopping at various observation points and reading the displays that they had there in place. It was just a, it was a wonderful thing to do. It was hard, 
because it was very uneven and those, those stones were, were not level and you were stepping over things and, and then you had to climb up through little stairs and sometimes on a little ladder to pass through one tower, one citadel to another. Now, of course, that wall is not, not the wall of the city of Jerusalem that the psalmist describes. It's a much more recent wall built hundreds of years ago. But still, it gave you this feeling, as the psalmist describes, of walking around on the ramparts, looking at the towers, counting the citadels, thinking of the stories that had taken place over there across all the years. When you looked over through the stones to the outside, you could see these incredible vistas of the New Jerusalem lying just outside and then up on the hill, other places as well. But when you looked on the inside of the wall, what you did is you looked down into the crowded, compact, different quarters of Jerusalem. You were looking down into people's homes, into their courtyards, into these little warrens of buildings that were so neatly woven together. And we know that the city is divided up into different quadrants. There's a Christian quadrant and the Muslim quadrant and the Armenian quadrant and the Orthodox quadrant. And so you were imagining these different peoples and you could see clotheslines. You could see satellites for satellite TVs. You could see young children running around in their school uniforms. You could see women coming out into the courtyard to do laundry or sort out things that they had just gotten from the grocery store. And the one thing I noticed was that as you stop to look down into these people's homes, into these people's lives, the gaze that you received back from them wasn't always so welcoming. How would you like to have tourists walking around the top of your house every day, peering over down at, at what you were doing? But it was hard not to look, but you felt that tension, and you felt like you needed to keep moving on, and, and you began to wonder, what if I have to come down off the walls right there in the midst of that little setting to that little scene? Would they welcome me? Would they be glad that I was there? The psalmist says, walk about Mount Zion, count her towers, consider her ramparts, view her citadels, that you may tell of them to the next generation. Now, as we've said, the psalmist speaks about the city of Jerusalem as a manifestation of God's rule in the world. The city is not God. And the city is not the kingdom of God, but in the psalmist's heart and through his faith, it points to and expresses the reality of God's rule in their lives. The reality of God's provision for them, the reality of God's keeping them safe. You can imagine how earth-shattering it must have been to the Jewish people when the city of Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. When all the buildings were destroyed, when the temple itself was torn down, and so many of the inhabitants taken prisoner and exiled to another land, to another part of the world, they must have wondered in despair what's happened to our home. What's happened to our homeland? What's happened to our God? What has happened to us? We know how closely our sense of self and our sense of identity and belonging is tied to our homes, or our homelands, our hometowns, our countries. It's interesting, the word that's translated in the New Revised Standard Version, which I read in the passage from Mark, Jesus came to his own hometown, it's translated, but in many other translations, it says it came, he came to his home country. He came to his homeland. They can be so intimately tied together. All these ideas about place and where we're from. And we know that for better or for worse, they are a part of the story of who we are. When we pulled up behind a car the other day at a red light, it had an Alabama license plate on it. And Helen immediately began to tell me what county in Alabama that car was from. 
I, I never could figure out how she could do that until I realized that on the Alabama license plate, the numbers stand for different counties, and she had memorized at some point all the counties. And so I asked her, do you still think of Alabama as your home state? Oh, yes, she said without hesitating. <laughs> I said, really? What about it makes you think home? And she said, that stretch of highway from Birmingham to Tuscaloosa, that would be the road going back and forth between her home and her grandparents' home. And thinking about the number of times her family traveled that road late in the evening or early in the morning. I began to think about that and, and what she had said about how a stretch of highway reminded her of home. And it made me think of coming home late from Jacksonville to visit my grandparents when I was young. Often I'd be in the back of the station wagon, lying down, dozing there when you did that kind of thing with my little sister in those days. And we hit that stretch of mills, that stretch of mills that begins where Winter Park and Orlando come together and it seems like the road is just composed of large slabs of concrete. And between all those large slabs is a little division. And when the wheels hit the, that stretch of road, you begin to hear a certain beat, a certain rhythm. Kabunk, 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 kabunk. And when I'd hear that, I knew we were almost home. Where is home for you? What's your hometown? What's your homeland? What's the place you would tell your children about or tell a stranger about that might help them to know your story? I realize that over the years, I've watched many different people in our congregation here move in and out of different homes over the years. Some have moved from starter homes to larger family homes on the other side of the city. Some people have moved from one area of town that has begun to change and move to another area of the city that seemed more suitable to them at that time. Many of you at the death of a spouse have moved from a home you've been in almost your whole married life to Westminster Towers or Winter Park Towers. And that's a big shift in life, a big shift in mindset, and I'm sure it's accompanied by questions about, who am I now? How can this be home? Will it be home? I remember when Fred and Ruth Crockford moved from their home in Audubon Park, a home they had built and lived in for over 50 years, into Westminster Towers. The street they lived in, on over in Audubon Park, that street was named after their daughter, Christine, Christine Street. Since they were the first ones in the neighborhood, they got to name the street. And from their new home in Westminster Towers, Fred could look out and see I-4, a highway he helped to build right through the middle of Orlando when he worked for the Department of Transportation. After a career with the Army Corps of Engineers, building roads and runways. From his new home over there in Westminster Towers, out, on the, out up from the eighth floor window, he had a bird's eye view of his old neighborhood and part of his career's work. I wonder what kind of shift in mindset that required of them. Do you ever long to go back home again? To a grandparent's home, to your childhood home, to your hometown? And, and if you did, what would you find? What would you hope to find? What would you hope to experience? What would you hope to see and know about yourself? Jesus went back to his hometown of Nazareth, the place where he grew up, and where his family still lived. He spoke and he taught in the synagogue. And the people listened and they were amazed. They were impressed by his wisdom. They were aware of the reports of miracles that he had performed in other places. Maybe they welcomed him at first, but then something changed 
and they were quickly put off by him. They were offended. Does that surprise you? Maybe it shouldn't surprise us, really. The people who know you best may also be the ones who are most likely to think that you've become someone different from who they are and different from who they think you are or should be. We know who he is. What's all this stuff he's talking about? That's not who we are. He's trying to be someone better than us. But we know his family. Look, his brothers and his sisters, they're right here. We know where he's from. We know who we are. And he's not like us anymore. As a result, Jesus can't do any miracles there. He can only heal a few sick people, Mark says. Mark says that Jesus is amazed by their lack of faith. He, he then goes on and, and continues his ministry from village to village. And then he sends his disciples out to continue his ministry. And perhaps as they go out to face the same rejection that he experienced, he gave them his authority and he gave them his specific instructions. Stay at the houses where they welcome you. Be at home there. Don't be too quick to leave. But if the, if the message that God's kingdom is breaking in through Jesus' words and deeds, the message that he has given him, that Jesus himself is the bearer of God's kingdom, if that message leads to offense and rejection when you go out, just like it did to me when I went back to Nazareth, my hometown, then Jesus told them, this is what I want you to do. Just shake the dust off your sandals and keep on moving. Wherever you're not welcomed, keep moving. Don't let rejection hang on to you and hinder you, dissuade you from sharing about God's kingdom. And the disciples went out and carried on Jesus' ministry, announcing God's kingdom, calling for repentance, demonstrating God's kingdom by driving out demons and anointing people, at healing them. I read an article this week by Albert La Rosa Rojas, who teaches theology and ethics at Western Theological Seminary, and the article was called Liturgies of Belonging, a, Th a Theology of Migrant Experience. And he talks about growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, a child of immigrants from Peru, and all of the difficulties and tensions that involved as a child, as he was growing up, and as a teenager, he was doing everything he could to blend in with the, with the larger American culture and community and context while his parents were trying to do everything they could to get him to remember his Peruvian history, his background, his roots, his culture. The harder they pushed, the harder he resisted. And, and they would do things like say to him, when we die, be sure to bury us in our homeland, but don't you ever plan on going back there yourself? He was constantly caught in this sense of tension, what he described as displacement and and dislocation. He became a member of a, a church, a wonderful church there, and he said he always felt so welcome there, and he heard their message of how all who came were, were beginning to be woven together into God's new community, and that whoever you were, you were woven into God's new community, and you belonged there, but along with that message also came a message of, but you need to leave that behind where you came from, and begin to look like and act like the, the Christian faith as we're, we're teaching it to you here and now in this place as, as we're leaving it out. So he struggled with that. Even in the midst of belonging there in the church, he didn't know what to do with who he was and where he was from. And it wasn't until while he was in seminary one summer in 2013 that he came back for the summer and went to work at a factory and he said he began to hear a different kind of liturgy from the people working in the factory. 
also immigrants from all across Central America and South America. He began to hear how they talked with great gratitude and thanksgiving for God being with them on their journeys, for God keeping them safe, for God's being with them now. He began to hear them described how they were doing everything they could to send a little money back home to their relatives, but maybe also to send a little money back home for a place for them if they ever returned. He began to experience the joy and the celebration that they all shared together, talking about where they were from, acknowledging where they were from, emphasizing where they were from. And he said one, one day when he had first gotten there, it was at lunch. It was at lunch where he first learned the factory's liturgy because he was reprimanded by one of the elder women when he started to eat lunch before offering to others the lunch that he had brought from his home to the table. They were angry at him. You just don't sit down and begin to eat what you brought here without offering what you've brought with all of us to share together. The gratitude toward God shared by my fellow workers, he said, expressed itself powerfully when all would gather around the table and each person shared a part of their meal with others. A Peruvian, he said, I had never had pupasas or corn tortillas. And when I showed them my Peruvian ceviche, they all looked at me with uncertainty. And they said, why isn't there any shrimp in it? Where's the tomato sauce? It was a good reminder to him that Latin America is not a singular region, but one with a vast diversity of cultures and peoples. And he said that by the end of the summer, the liturgy of the factory had begun to do its job. I felt for the first time in my whole life what my parents had been trying to inculcate in me for many years, that I belonged here in this place and among these immigrants from Latin America, and that I belonged to them precisely because I was Peruvian and not just lumped into a big category of Hispanic. Fragments of all our homes, he said, shared in the shape of stories and food were the very means by which new stories, new food, and a new sense of home were being cultivated with others around me. The liturgy at the factory was formed around gratitude to God for the gifts of our homelands and cultures, and then it turned outward toward the formation of a community centered on the sharing of gifts at the table. The liturgy, to me, he said, seemed to be an icon of Christ described in the Gospels. We brought the fragments of the homes we had left behind to the table, where the Spirit weaved them together in new forms of life, new forms of communion, all in anticipation of a foretaste of the great homecoming when Christ returns to make the earth God's dwelling place. He experienced that in what he called the liturgy of the factory. We are invited this morning to experience that in the liturgy of this table. The liturgy of home and belonging, of gathering together, to share in God's life-giving word, in the gift of Jesus present here with us, in the gift of the Spirit weaving us into a new community of God's dwelling. In a very real sense, just as the psalmist looked to Jerusalem as expression of God's presence and God's strength, we look to this table we look to this community, we look to each other as our spiritual home. This is where you belong with all the stories of home and hometown and homeland that make you who you are. Here is where you can bring the gifts that you have to offer to God and share with others. Look around, the psalmist says. This is our God forever and ever, and God will be our guide even to the end. Look around, Jesus says, and remember to stay where you are welcome. 
And this is where Jesus welcomes us. Every one of us. Stay here. Know this is your home where God's Spirit embraces you, renews you, and creates with you and others the very dwelling place of God. Amen.